We are continuing in our study this morning of Acts, and yes, you are reading it correctly. On your bulletin there, it says Acts 25 and 26. We are entering into the last part, the last four chapters of Acts. And really, a lot of what we're going to be reading now is, is this, this journey, right? It's what Paul is going through right now as he is in, was in Jerusalem, now Caesarea, the, the trials and the tribulations that he is going through as he makes his way to Rome, as he makes his way to Caesar. And so there is a lot of history here, and there's a lot that's happening, but I think a lot of these things that we have already covered in different ways. And so we're going to go pretty quickly through 25 and part of 26, and then we're going to camp out for a little while at the end of 26, okay? So, um, so that's, that's why we're doing it this morning. Because I feel like we have covered these things multiple ways and in uh, multiple times in different ways. Um, and so we're going to go quickly through that. So read with me together or follow along with me as I read chapter 25 and then 26 up to 11. And then we're going to stop at 11 and I'll read 12 uh, to the end of the chapter here in, in just a few moments. Another reason I wanted to do both at the same time is because I, I think when you start breaking these stories up too much, you lose the flow. You, you, you lose the understanding of really the dynamics of what is happening here at this particular time in Acts. And so remember that when we ended last week, and John Lindner brought this up, and I appreciate him bringing it up, because this is how it ends. Uh, 24, 27, chapter 24, verse 27. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Paul spent two years in prison under Felix. And then he continues to stay in jail under Festus. So what is happening during this time? Now we don't know. We don't know really exactly what's happening during this time. How was he spending his time? But we feel pretty confident that he was continuing to teach and to preach as much as he could while he was being detained. Now we know that, that, that Felix had made it to where people could come and see him and certainly that was a good thing. They could bring him food and so forth. But I'm sure people were continuing to come and learn from him and as they learned, they would go out and teach others. And so he was, he was not being muffled completely. He was not being squelched completely. He still had a voice. And it's, it may be during this time also that he actually wrote what, two of what we call the prison letters. Now we don't know for sure. You know, he could have wrote them when he was in Rome in prison, but there's a real possibility they could have read, uh, written a couple of them here. The, the prison letters, uh, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. There is evidence to suggest that he possibly could have written Colossians and Philemon while he was in prison in Caesarea under Felix. And so Paul is going to make the best use of his time, and that could be one way that he made it. But the fact is, he spent two years in jail under Felix. I think that is hard for us to comprehend. We, we read it 2,000 years later, and we kind of gloss over that, and he spent two years in jail. Oh, wow. And then we move on. That's a lot of time. But we continue to remember and know that God is in control. So the fact that he spent two years in jail, God was using that in some way, although we don't have it spelled out here for us exactly what that looked like. But we believe that he was continuing to do something because two years later, which we're going to read here in a moment, the Jews still wanted to kill him. Remember the whole reason he went to Caesarea to begin with? It was because the Jews wanted to kill him. Here we are two years later, and they are still plotting to kill him. So Paul is continuing to be faithful and to be obedient to the call that God had placed upon him, and that was to proclaim the gospel message. So we start here in 25. <clears throat> and Felix has left. Now Festus is, is, is the governor of the, of the province. Now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul. And they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept, excuse me, <clears throat> being kept at Caesarea, and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, said he, let the men of authority among you 
go down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. <clears throat> After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of, law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before them, before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed? To Caesar you shall go. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priest and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points, thank you. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man who about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write to my Lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined, examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. So Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time if they are willing to testify that according to the strictest party of our religion I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. 
And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Thank you, Isaac. Wow. What an opportunity Paul has. And Paul doesn't shrink from this opportunity, does he? We, we, we have Felix who's, who's coming in and uh, Festus, I'm sorry. Festus who's coming in after Felix. And can you imagine what it's like for Festus? I mean, Festus has to be excited, right, about this new position. But yet he takes office and he realizes that Felix has left a man in prison that, that is going to be a major pain in his side. Because whatever he does, I mean, if he, if, he, if, if he doesn't go through the regular Roman process, then he'd get in trouble with the Roman authorities. If he doesn't give the Jews what they want, they're going to be angry with him. And so what does he do? The fact is it takes a strong and principled leader to make the right decisions when they know it will cost them politically. And Festus knew whatever decision he made in this particular instance, it was going to cost him politically. And so what was true 2,000 years ago is true today, right? We see our political leaders kicking the can down the road a little ways so they don't have to make the hard decisions. That's part of human nature, I believe. That's part of who we are. If it's going to cost us too much, then maybe I'll just leave it to the next person. I'll let them deal with it. That's what Felix did to Festus. And so I can only imagine... After Festus tries to work it out and he even asks Paul, Paul, hey, what do you think about going to Jerusalem and having the trial there? Can you imagine what Paul was thinking when he said that? Are you kidding me? Do you remember the kangaroo court that found my Savior guilty over two decades ago? I'm not going to put myself in that same kind of situation because that's exactly what he would have done. Now, granted, Festus was there, and Festus would have had the final authority, but if Festus had been in Jerusalem, it would have probably been a lot easier for him to go along with the Jews. Paul's not going to allow that. And it's interesting that they, he uses, Luke uses the word favor. He asks a favor three different times within ten verses. Festus is all about the favors. He wants to do a favor for the Jews. He's asking Paul to do a favor for him. Why? So he can please the Jews. He's not willing to make the hard decision here. And the fact is, Paul has laid it out beautifully for him, right? They come with their accusations, the Jews do. And what does it say here? That there is really nothing. They could not prove anything. And then Paul stands up and says, listen, they have presented their case. And as you can see, I have done nothing. I have said nothing. I have sinned not against the law or against the temple or against Caesar. Really, the three things that they could get him on. The, the, the temple, if indeed, he, if he had defiled the temple, then, then he was within his rights, Festus was in his rights to, to hand Paul over. But he had not. If he had said something against Caesar, then Festus would have been within his rights to find him guilty and to punish him in many different ways. Again, he did not. So here is Paul, and he's laying out his defense, and he does it beautifully, and Festus is in a quandary because he doesn't really know what to do with this man until Paul appeals to Caesar. And I could just hear Festus just breathe this huge sigh of relief. Okay, you're a Roman citizen. You want to go to Caesar? You're going to go to Caesar. And he could do that. Paul could do that, remember, because he is a Roman citizen. And because he has, he's a Roman citizen, he has certain rights that others do not have. And one of those rights is to actually appeal to Caesar. And so Festus is happy, I'm sure, that he has done this. So now I can send him on. I can start making plans and I can get on with my life as governor without this thorn in my side called Paul and the Jews. Maybe they'll just go back to Jerusalem and I won't hear any more of that. But then we have 
the scene changes somewhat. Agrippa and Bernice come on the scene. Now, Ag Agrippa and Bernice, Agrippa was, was a king at this time. And he was over that particular region. He didn't have as much power ultimately as, as Festus did, but he had a lot of authority. And so I think Festus looked at this as, as an opportunity to say, well, wait a minute. Here's someone that actually has authority over the Jewish people. Agrippa II actually was over the temple. It was up to him to make sure that the temple was taken care of. He was the one who appointed the high priest. Can you imagine how this made the Jewish people feel? Someone like an Agrippa II having that kind of authority over them? Having that kind of authority to name their next high priest who assuredly was for political reasons and not for the spiritual well-being of the Jewish people. So Agrippa comes on the scene and Festus sees an opportunity to ask one more person, what do you think about this whole situation? Now, who, who is Agrippa II? And, and you guys are going to find this really, really interesting because there's sometimes, you know, you have the, the family tree, ancestry.com and those types of things where you can go on and, and find out your family tree and your lineage and all of that. And I have never done that. And honestly, I, think, I don't think I've done it because I'm a little worried about what I'm going to find in my past. Honestly, I don't care what I find in my past. It is going to pale in comparison to the lineage that this man has. Because this is, this is who was in his his father and grandfather and even uncle and so forth. He's the son of Agrippa I. Agrippa I was, we find him in Acts 12, and he is the one that put James to death. Okay? So that's his father. His great, or his grandfather rather, great-grandfather was Herod the Great. And remember Herod the Great? Hearing of a coming king put all the, babe, the male babies to death under two years old around the region of Bethlehem. Remember this when Jesus was born? This is the man that wanted to maintain control and keep his kingship no matter the cost. And he was willing to put untold numbers of male infants to death. We know about his great uncle, Herod the Tetrarch, who had John the Baptist murdered. These are the men that are in his family tree. And the apple didn't fall very far. Bernice is Agrippa II's full sister. Yet, we know that they had a relationship with one another. And everyone knew about this as well. Again, one more reason that the Jews did not like Agrippa II. They understood where he came from. They understood his family line. They understood the blood that went through this man's veins. And he was very much of that same leaning and tendencies to, ha to maintain power, whatever it took. Whoever he, had, whoever he had to put down, whatever he needed to do, he was going to do that. But then also to have Bernice, his sister, as, for all intents and purposes, his wife as well. They knew this. He was an abomination. Yet he had great power in Jerusalem. Festus knew this. He was hoping that Festus, uh, uh, that, that Agrippa could maybe shine a little light on this and maybe help him. And so he recounts this. He recounts the story of who Paul is and what has happened and the Jews, the, all of the accusations that the Jews have made. He recounts it. And what does, what does Agrippa say? I want to hear this man. I, I want to hear this man for myself. I'm intrigued. And I'm sure that Agrippa had already heard of Paul by this time. I mean, Paul had been all throughout the region, all throughout the empire. Word of Paul, I'm sure, had made it back to Agrippa. And now here's Agrippa. And in his good fortune, he's going to be able to have an audience with this man, Paul, that he has heard so much about. So the next day, he recounts the perplex... Uh, he, he, he rather... After recounting everything, he says, okay, you will hear Paul tomorrow. And so the next day, Agrippa and Bernice come with great pomp. This is 25-23. Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Uh, you need to understand how big of a deal this is. This isn't just, hey, uh, Agrippa and Bernice, if you guys just go over in that room over there, I'll bring Paul in, okay, when he's ready. And it was just them. No, this was a huge occasion with great pomp. And then the type of men that were there for this. 
Bernice and Agrippa probably came in in their purple robes, right? Purple being the color of, of royalty. They probably came in with their, their band of gold, their, their type of crowns that they would wear at that time. Festus was probably wearing a scarlet robe that, they, that, that, that governors at this time would wear when they went to big and uh, important occasions like this. And so here we have uh, Agrippa and Bernice and what they're wearing. We have the governor coming in and so forth and what he's wearing. But then, again, we have the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. This is, as Dave Ramsey would say, this is a big deal. Okay? This is a big deal. But how incredible an opportunity for Paul. How amazing this is that indeed it's just not Agrippa and Bernice but it's all these powerful people. Now we don't know what effect what is being said here and Paul's testimony had upon these people, but we can only imagine that God used his words to transform, to draw people into a relationship and start the process of transforming them. We just don't have it written here. We know, unfortunately, that Agrippa and Bernice did not. We know that Festus, to the best of our ability, did not. He, he dies within a couple of years of taking office and we don't have any, any uh, history of him coming to Christ and following him but what an amazing opportunity and Paul understands this because he says I am thankful thankful to come before you Agrippa and these aren't platitudes Paul is not a platitude person he's going to speak truth and I think Paul is 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 speaking truth when he says this when he comes I consider myself fortunate this is 26 too I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I am to make my defense today. Why is this? Because Agrippa understood Jewish culture. Agrippa understood a lot of the prophecies, a lot of the, what we consider the Old Testament today. He understood a lot of that. He, understood, he knew a lot of the prophecies. He, he was over the temple. He was over uh, the high priest and appointed them. He knew a lot about their customs and their culture. And so Paul saw, saw this as a great opportunity. Fantastic. I don't have to go back and catch you up. I don't have to go back through explaining all the prophecies, explaining why we believe that this Messiah is coming, because you have a general knowledge of that. And that's a good thing. So I could just start right in and help you understand why I am who I am, why I live the way I live, why I'm proclaiming what I am proclaiming, why I, why I am willing to sit in jail for two years and not recant any of my beliefs. I find this incredibly, uh, incredibly good fortune for you to hear my testimony, Agrippa. So he talks about his, his upbringing, and, and people know this about Paul. Now this has been you know, many, many years <laughs> later now that Paul had come to Christ, over 20 years. But still, Paul grew up in Jerusalem. Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest rabbis, maybe the greatest rabbi, rabbi of the first century. Paul was known as a great persecutor of the church at one point. But now Paul is known for something else, being a great champion of the cause of Christ. The grip is not ignorant of these things. But now he has an opportunity to speak to Agrippa personally and say, listen, you probably know my history. This is who I am. This is, I grew up in Jerusalem. I grew up at the feet of Gamaliel. I, I, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. All of these different things. I was a persecutor of the church. So I'm not taking any of this stuff lightly. I didn't just, just wake up one day and said, I'm going to start proclaiming that indeed just Jesus is a Messiah. There's a really good reason that I believe this. And that's what he started to get into here in verse 12 and following. He reminds him that, that he was one that punished them and persecuted them in the synagogues. He was one of the ones that cast the vote to put Christians to death. But everything changed one day. And that's what he gets to here in 12, 26, 12 and following. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus. He was on his way to Damascus, right, to persecute believers once again. I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people from all and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Whoo, what a calling that God has just placed upon Paul. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all uh, the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds and keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. There's a lot happening here as far as what Paul is saying, but I really think that we can, we can break it down into three different headings, and I'm going to be kind of going for, for, from, to, from one place to another within these verses that we just read, because I, I really think that Paul's speech before Agrippa, Agrippa provides the most comprehensive defense of his evangelistic ministry in Acts. And I think as we go through this, you'll, you'll see what I mean by that. First, you know, Jesus said, it is hard for you, Paul, to kick against the goads. And we know what a goad is, right? When you have an ox, you have this little, this little stick, and you would put it right, right here in their Achilles. And that would, keep them, that would keep them moving. They couldn't kick against it. It would hurt too much. So you would keep them going in the, in the direction that you wanted them to go just by prodding them with this, this goad. And, and I think Jesus is saying to Paul, listen, Paul, I have a plan here. You're not going to thwart it. Matter of fact, you're going to be a big part of it. And here's what you're going to do. And so he explains it to him in this first part, this incredible calling that he places upon Paul. But, but I want us to, to see this as we go through these things. Yes, these things are very specific to Paul, the calling that he has upon him and so forth. But it's also, I think, a calling upon us as well. Or a, a, we need to understand these things to better understand what he has called us to what he has called us to, what he has called us to proclaim, and then the results out of that proclamation. So those are really the three things that we're going to be looking at here. The first one is God calls and enables us to be his witnesses. That's what he does here in 26, 16, right? But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen and to those in which I will appear to you. So he, God places this call upon him and he says, you're going to be a servant and a witness to the things that you have. I love the way he says this. Did you catch it? To appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. I think he is saying there, listen, 
you're going to be a witness as to the things that, that I have done, that I have already done, and certainly that I have done for you, Paul, because you understand why I came, why I had to die. You understand the salvation that you have in me and the forgiveness of your sins. But he doesn't stop there, the things that you will see me do. And, and I think so often when we talk about our testimony, right, we oftentimes end with, the, the, that moment when we made that decision, that moment when he, when he drew us into that relationship and we committed our lives and our hearts to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we, we embraced, we, we understood our sinfulness and embraced the forgiveness that we have in him. And I think Paul certainly would do that. That's what he's doing here, right? He said, listen, do you understand what kind of life I had before? But that's before I met Jesus. So we do that as well in our testimony. Listen, this is who I was before Jesus. This is who I am now because of Jesus. And this is what I have seen him do in my life. So I think that's what he's calling him to do here. You're going to be a witness. You're going to go out and you're going to proclaim what I have done. You're going to proclaim what I have done in your life. But you're also going to continue to proclaim what you see me doing. And I think he was doing a lot because Paul tells him, he said, listen, Agrippa knows what's going on here. Festus, you think I'm out of my mind, but he knows. He knows the prophets. He knows the prophecies. He knows that we were waiting for someone to come. And he, he, I'm sure he went back into all the prophecies from Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Well, he probably didn't then, but in his mind, he was probably thinking these things of all these amazing things that this Messiah would do. Agrippa, you know the prophecies, right? Do you believe the prophecies? Because if you believe the prophecies, they have come true in Jesus. This new covenant that was coming, this new time when God's law was not, would no longer be on uh, tablets of stone, but his law would be written on our hearts. These, these, these stone hearts that we once had would turn to flesh because of the work of Christ. These are the prophecies that have been fulfilled in Jesus. And Agrippa, these things didn't happen in a corner. You have been a witness to what Christ is doing throughout the world. And when we say the world, we mean the Roman Empire. Because Paul had told us in one of his letters that indeed the gospel had been proclaimed throughout the world. And again, the world as they knew it was the Roman Empire. Agrippa knew of these things. He knew of what, of how the church was growing. He knew about these followers of Jesus. He knew that people's lives had been changed. But the question is, did he believe that it was all because of this risen Messiah? The one that the prophets foretold about. What is Paul doing here 20 years, 20 something years later after meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus? He's following him. He's doing what he called him to do. He's placed that call upon him, enabling him to be a witness. He does the same for us. He, en he calls us and he enables us to be his witness. And just as he did Paul here in 17 where he sends Paul, he says, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes. He sends us as well. So please understand that while these are specific to Paul, it's still a calling upon us as followers of Jesus. God calls and enables us to be his witness. He sends us. He helps us. He says here in, in verse 22, To this day I have had the help that comes from God, so I stand here and testify both to small and great. How is he doing this? Is he doing this in his own strength? No, he's doing this by God's help, by his help, by his, the power of his spirit. He is going forth to accomplish the purposes that God has called him to. He helps Paul accomplish his, he helped Paul accomplish his purposes, and he helps us, or at least he is he wants to help us. He desires to help us. How often, though, do we get ahead of him? How often do we believe that we can do it in our own strength, and so we just do it, we go? And God says, don't get ahead of me. I have called you to something glorious and wonderful and beautiful, but don't get ahead of me. Because I'm going to help you to accomplish all that I have called you to. 
just trust in me. Stop trusting so much in yourself. I think we have a beautiful example of someone in Paul who did just that. Paul was one of the most capable men in the history of Christianity. If anyone had, had the, the, maybe not the right, but would probably have that thought, I could do this, I'm going to go, 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 I could do this. It would have been Paul, but Paul understood he could do nothing without Christ. He could do nothing without his spirit. He was the one that empowered him and enabled him to do what he needed to do. The help comes from and he also says here in 23, right after 22, that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Do you notice what he says here? First to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. He didn't say, Paul didn't say, and he would have us he says he would proclaim. Now the fact is, he does have us proclaim, right? And that's really the, the second part of this. He calls, God calls and enables us to be his witnesses. But then the second one, in our role as witnesses of Christ, we must respond obediently to God's call. We must be obedient to proclaim the good news. We must be obedient to, to show the love of Christ to those around us, knowing that it's not us. If we are faithfully proclaiming the word, if we are faithfully proclaiming the gospel in the way that he has spelled it out here for us, then it's not just us proclaiming the gospel. It is Jesus himself. I hope that's encouraging to you. I hope that's encouraging to you that, that he does want to use us to be his mouthpiece. He does want to use us to proclaim the gospel. And if we do it faithfully, and if we do it not adding to and not subtracting from, but we give the gospel the way that it is proclaimed in his word that Jesus himself is the one who is going to proclaim. Is that kind of hard to get our mind around? But we know this is true, right? It's not our words. It's not our words that bring people to faith. Now, he can use our words. He can use us, right? Right? We are his mouthpiece. But we know ultimately it is his spirit. It is his spirit that as these words are spoken, it's his spirit that opens up people's eyes, people open up people's hearts to understand the truth of what is being spoken, to understand the truth that we're all sinners, to understand the truth that it's only through Jesus that we are reconciled. That should give us great confidence as we talk to people to know that it's not up to me to bring this person into a saving relationship with Jesus. He just calls me to be obedient. In the way, same way that he is called to be obedient here, Paul is we are called to be obedient. Jesus says, I'll take care of the rest. I will do what I'm going to do. I will accomplish what I need to and want to accomplish through you. Just be obedient. So it's our role as witnesses of Christ. We must respond obediently, just as Paul did here in verse 19. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, he tells Agrippa. We must not be disobedient to the vision and the calling that he has placed upon our lives. And then he goes on in verse 25 to say, I was speaking true and rational words. Boy, what does he say here? Because he's, he's, Festus has just said, you're mad, you're insane, Paul. And Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. That's what we are called to do, right? Right? Now, the irony there is, and Jesus has told us this, that we can speak reasonable words. We can speak words of truth to people, helping them to understand from Scripture, this, and, this is who we are. This is the, the fact is we are lost in our sins. This, this, this is the, the, the truth of the matter. Jesus came and he lived a sinless life. He did not sin and he died on the cross for our sins and he rose again in three days to confirm all that he said. And we can be forgiven of our sins because of what Christ has done. Now we know that is perfectly reasonable. We know from Scripture it's perfectly reasonable. And we know that if they had been truly taking Scripture seriously, if they had truly been taking Moses and the prophets seriously, then they would have seen how reasonable this is. 
because he's not saying anything outlandish. He's just confirming what the prophet said has now come true. It's not unreasonable. It's, in fact, absolutely reasonable. It is the logical conclusion of everything we have believed for thousands of years. So everything we say, if indeed we are teaching and proclaiming what is in God's word and not our own teaching, it's reasonable. But what does scripture tell us? That the words that we speak when we proclaim the gospel, people are going to see it as absolute foolishness. And they're going to see us as insane. Unless God is doing a work in them. Unless God is, is, is taking the blinders off and, and opening up their hearts and their, their, their understanding to, to see the truth of the gospel. So, but let's not, let's not put pressure on ourselves. Well, they're going to think we're foolish, so I'm not going to do this. That's just fear of man. That's being more concerned about what man thinks of you than you are about being obedient to the calling that God has placed upon every single one of us. Right? That's fear. That's fear of man. I'm worried that they're going to think I'm a fool. Let's take a page out of Paul right here and say, I don't care if that's just what you think. I'm not insane. You may think, as we talk to people around us, listen, what I am saying here, and, I, and let's just be honest here, when we talk to people about this, when we are talking to unbelievers and we are relating these things, have you ever had this thought? What I am just saying sounds, in, sounds like fantasy. Right? I mean, let's just be honest. It is so fantastic. Fantastic in the sense that it is, wow, I really believe this. I can understand, you know, you're sitting there thinking, you're saying this, I'm sitting here thinking, I know that they're going to think I'm absolutely insane. Because I'm saying this, it just sounds fantastic. It sounds like fantasy. But the wonderful thing is, it is fantastic. It is absolutely true. And the reason that we in here can believe this, the reason that we can say, that's not, that's just, the reason we're not saying it's just fantasy, it's because God has done a work in our heart and he has opened up our eyes to see the truth of this. And praise God for that. So when we're talking to people and you're afraid that, oh, I don't know if I want to do this, it's just going to sound so crazy to them. Yeah, it is. That's exactly what Jesus said. It's going to be absolute foolishness to them unless he's doing a work in them. And the thing is, we have no idea who he's doing a work on. I've told you guys this before, and I do live by this as much as I can, as much as I can. I falter often, but when I come into, a con when I come into contact with someone and I have a conversation, my assumption is, God, you are doing something in this person. You are drawing this person to you in some way. You are doing something in them. And so that's, that, that, that's the assumption that I make about people that God brings into my path. And I think that's a really good assumption that every single one of us should make. If we believe that we serve a sovereign God, if we believe that, that God is in control and that he wants to use us, that he has placed a calling upon our lives, and he indeed wants to use us to proclaim and make the good news known, there are no chance meetings. He is the one that brings people into our lives. And when we faithfully proclaim, he will do what he needs to do to bring about his purposes and to complete his plan. He just asks us to be faithful. Why? For what purpose? For what purpose is God enabling us to be his witnesses? For what purpose is, is, is he asking us to be witnesses? It is, so what? He, and he tells us here, when, when, when Agrippa says, <laughs> you're going to persuade me to be a Christian, Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become as I am, except for these change. Why? So that people come to Christ. So that people come to know Jesus. That they may, in verse 18, as it says here, turn that, that, that God would open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me, is what Jesus said. 
That's the reason we do these things. And we don't care. We should not care what the world thinks about us. Richard Dawkins, you guys have probably heard this in The God Delusion. He says, when one person suffers from a delusion, it is called insanity. When many people suffer from a delusion, it is called religion. You know what? Let people think we're delusional. Should we care? No, we shouldn't. As long as we are faithfully proclaiming truth, as, as long as we are faithfully representing truly the gospel, the world's going to think these things. But that's okay. Because what's more important? Us being embarrassed and people thinking that we're foolish? Or being obedient, proclaiming the gospel, and someone coming to Christ? I think it's a no-brainer, right? Think me a fool all day long if you want to. The resurrection was indeed insanity to Festus. Unbelievable. Just because of the history and what they had seen and the stories that had been going around, but indeed he thought it was a delusion. And in this, in a world where belief in the supernatural was the norm of that day, but he did not believe And today we live in a world that is becoming more and more secular by, not by the day, but by the second. A world that sees no place for the supernatural, much less for someone who died and rose again for our sins. And we must admit, it is indeed fantastic. Fantastic in the sense that it is hard to believe, but fantastic in the sense that it is absolutely true. And it is glorious news for both the Jew and the Gentile, both great and small. Brothers and sisters, in closing, let me just say, I praise God for the growth that we have seen here at Cross Life Community Church. I do. I am rejoicing in how God is building His church. But as Renee and I were talking just this past week, we yearn, and I know you do as well, we yearn to see this church grow not just from, from people coming to town or, or transferring from another church if indeed the gospel's not being preached, if the Bible's not being believed. I'm fine with, people call it stealing sheep. If they're not being fed, come on into our pen. I'm okay with that. But the way that I want to see cross life really grow, and I know you do too, is through people coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Am I right in that? If I'm right in that, say Amen. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take primarily two things. First and foremost, it's going to take us praying. It's going to take us praying that, that God would indeed give us a heart for the lost. It's going to take us praying that He will give us opportunities. Because I've talked to enough of you to know that for, for various reasons and good reasons, there aren't a lot of opportunities. But let us be praying that God would give us opportunities. And guess what? He will. But then secondly, first is prayer. Secondly is we must be obedient to the call. When given the opportunity, we must take that opportunity to proclaim the good news. Does that mean that every person that we preach the gospel to, talk about Jesus with, is going to come to Christ? No, we have... This, we have this incredible ceremony. How many people came to Christ during that time? We don't know, but we have an account of at least a few that did not. Does that mean that everyone's going to come to Christ? No, we don't know who is. He just says, be faithful and proclaim. So let's do that. Let us be faithful to pray and let us be faithful to proclaim. I think if we do that, you know, we, we talk oftentimes, I want to be in the, uh, the will of God. Well, a lot could be said about the will of God, and I'm not going to go there right now. But we can be confident of this. It is the will of God that we pray for the lost. And it is the will of God that we proclaim truth to them. Let's be faithful and obedient to it.